acceptable to the people. To think that you were, you know, first of all, you were killed, your blood was let, and then you was mixed in with these pagan sacrifices. That would have been very offensive. So people would have said, well, that happened to them, to those guys, because they were worse sinners than the rest of us. And Jesus is saying, no, it happened because bad things happen. Now, it's not that they were perfect people. They weren't. They were sinners, but they were not worse sinners. And that's what's important for us. So when something bad happens to your neighbor, you say, oh, well, he got what was coming to him. All right. Or something bad happens to a politician. Yep, that must have been the judgment of God. They certainly deserve that. We've got to be careful. Now, I've been guilty of saying, well, these people deserve that because that's what they got. I've been guilty of that. So we all need to be careful that we understand that bad things do happen to people because we're all bad. We've all broken God's law in one way or another. We've all broken God's law in one way or another. But we also need to understand that there is the law of sowing and reaping. So if you continue to sow bad things, you have a higher likelihood of experiencing some kind of judgment or reaping a little bit sooner. All right, But it doesn't mean just because you suffered something bad that you're a, a worse person than somebody else. But because there is this law of reaping and sowing, then we should at least keep that in mind. And of course, there were the 18 who uh, were killed when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were worse offenders? No, they were not. And unless you repent, you will all perish as well. The word repent, metanoia in Greek, shuv in Hebrew, it means, metanoia means to have a change of mind, shuv means to turn around. They both mean, you know, you're going this way, then suddenly you say, this isn't the right way to go. I'm going to go back this way. So either way, Hebrew and Greek are saying the same thing. You have to repent. You're going in a particular direction, and then you realize this isn't the right direction to go. If you were going to visit somebody, and they lived uh, north on I-25, and you were going south, is it enough to just feel bad about going south? I feel really bad about going this direction. I know I'm going the wrong direction, and I feel terrible about it. But what will that do for you? Nothing, right? You've got to actually get the exit, turn around, and go the other direction. You have not repented until you've gotten off the exit and gotten back going north instead of south. That's what repentance is. It's not just feeling bad about it. Feeling bad is the beginning but it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to take action. And Jesus is challenging people, unless you repent, you will all perish as well. The word perish just means to die. He very likely is not speaking of their eternal destiny, but he's speaking about what will happen in the, uh, the short term in their life here. This may very well be a reference to when the Romans would come and destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. So he's telling them to, to repent, to turn back, and follow God's commands. And then he gives this parable. Now this parable about the fig tree is almost certainly a reference to Isaiah chapter 5. And here's what God says, I will sing to my love a song about my a song to my lover about his vineyard. My love had a vineyard on a fertile hill. So the the love here is is God. He, God, built a hedge around it, removed its stones and planted a vine. He built a tower in the middle of it and constructed a wine press. He waited for it to produce edible grapes, but it produced sour ones instead. So now, residents of Jerusalem, people of Judah, you decide between me and my vineyard. What more can I do for my vineyard beyond what I've already done? When I waited for it to produce edible grapes, why did it produce sour ones instead? Now I will inform you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge 
and turn it into pasture. I will break its wall and allow animals to graze there. I will make it a wasteland. No one will prune its vines or hoe its ground and thorns and briars will grow there. I will order the clouds not to drop any rain on it. Indeed, Israel is the vineyard of the Lord who commands armies. The people of Judah are the cultivated place in which he took delight. He waited for justice, but look what he got. Disobedience. He waited for fairness, but look what he got. Cries for help. So Jesus is probably using this as, as a reference, but here it's now a fig tree. The fig tree. We're going to see later that Jesus is going to walk by a fig tree and he's not going to find any fruit on it and he's going to curse the fig tree and immediately it's going to dry up. The fig tree is a reference to the nation of Judah. The vineyard seems to be, from Isaiah chapter 5, a reference to the greater land of Israel. So remember that you have Israel and then you have this smaller, just one tribe, right? But it, it would later become known as the southern kingdom of Judah, which included Judah, Benjamin, and of course the Levites who did not have their own land. So he's speaking here of a fig tree because we already know what happened to the vineyard. The vineyard was already dealt with. They were dealt with in between 722 and 712, somewhere in there BC. So now he's talking about the fig tree. So he planted a fig tree in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. Now it's interesting that when you plant something, you're supposed to let it lay fallow or just let it lay there for three years. And then the uh, in the fourth year, you should expect a harvest. And then the fifth year is when you actually get to eat of that fruit. So he's been looking for fruit. Why would he come looking for fruit? Because that's what you do on a tree. If you plant a fruit tree, what do you expect to get? You expect to get fruit from that tree because the fruit is good. It's tasty. It's delicious. And it brings pleasure. And here, this is a tree that's not doing anything. It's, it's kind of putting out its leaves, but there's never any fruit. It's a fake. And Jesus is talking about the nation of Judah. He's been coming for three years. Interesting that he would use this. Because what had Jesus been doing? He came, his entire ministry lasted for about three and a half years, right? So he came looking for fruit for three years, but he didn't find any. He kept looking for repentance and he did not find it. Now he did find it with individuals, but he did not find it in the leadership. The leadership should have said, we're waiting for Messiah. You fulfill all of the prophecies about Messiah, I mean, goodness, you're able to raise the dead, you give sight to the blind, you heal the lame, you cleanse the leper. Do you realize that not one Israelite or Jewish leper was ever cleansed of his leprosy? Not one. From the time of Miriam, she was cleansed. But from that time until the coming of Jesus, nobody in Israel had been cleansed of leprosy. Now we know about Naaman, the Syrian. He was cleansed, but he wasn't Jewish and he wasn't Israelite, was he? He was from Syria. And he was a big, powerful man. He came with all his money and he came to Elisha. And Elisha did not even come out to see him. He just said, go dunk yourself in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be cleansed. And he's all, oh, I'm not going to do it. But he, thankfully he had good advisors. Sir, you've come all this way. If he told you to do something really big, you would have done it. Why don't you just go try? What do you have to lose? Okay, he did it and he's cleansed. But until, since then, nobody in Israel, of Israel, had ever been cleansed for three years. All, Jesus had done all these miracles demonstrating 
that he was the Messiah. And his great message, turn back to Torah, follow God, do the right thing, and yet he found no fruit. He found no fruit. So when the worker says, sir, leave it alone this year too until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. Then if it bears fruit next year, very well. So for three and a half years, his ministry went on. And of course, he found nothing in the third year as well. Now he's going to say later, you will not see my face. He's going to say this here at the end of our chapter. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered you, longed to gather your children together as hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would have none of it. Look, your house is forsaken. He's talking about the house of Jerusalem and Judah. Because the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been desolate. It had been desolate for seven centuries. They were no longer. So Judah was the only show in town. And he says, you look, your house is forsaken. But I tell you, you will not see my face until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Yehovah. When they can finally say about Jesus, Yeshua, that he is welcome in the name of Yehovah, then they will see his face. Because they're not going to see it until they say that. So we know exactly what we're waiting for. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for the leadership in Israel to say, Baruch haba b'shem Yehovah concerning Yeshua. So when we say, well, you know, what's it going to take for Jesus to return? We know exactly. It's right here. Now, we don't know when. But when this does happen, then he will return. When they say that, then he will return. And I just have this sneaking suspicion that after the time of Jacob's trouble, after they have been decimated, the whole world has turned against the land of modern Israel, and the leadership of the Knesset says, you know what? We're toast. We have to come to that place where we finally acknowledge the one that we denied. Zechariah 12.10 I will pour out on the kingdom of kingship of David and the population of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look to me he be to Eli. They will look to me. It doesn't say they will look upon me, but they will look to me. Eli, to me, toward me. They will look to me for help. The one they have pierced. This and the population of Jerusalem. This is going to finally happen. Prophesied uh, five centuries, four centuries before the coming of Jesus by the prophet Zechariah, that one day the house of, of Jerusalem, David, would finally acknowledge who he was, the one that they pierced. They will lament for him as one laments for an only son, and there will be a bitter cry for him, like the bitter cry for a firstborn. On that day, the lamentation in Jerusalem will be as great as the lamentation in Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn clan by clan, the clan of the royal household of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the clan of the family of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the clan of the descendants of Levi by themselves, etc. And I have a feeling that as they're sitting maybe in a bunker, the remnant of the Knesset as they've been We've seen this massive destruction happen in the land of Israel. And all hope is gone. And they're finally having this discussion about Yeshua. They just might say something like this. Who would have believed what we just heard? When the Lord's power revealed through him, he sprouted up like a twig before God, like a root out of part soil. He had no stately form or majesty that we might catch our attention no special appearance that we should want to follow him. He was despised and rejected by people. 
one who experienced pain and was acquainted with illness. People hid their faces from him. He was a spy, and we considered him insignificant. But he lifted up our illnesses. He carried our pain, even though we thought he was being punished, attacked by God, and afflicted for something he had done. He was wounded because of our rebellious deeds, crushed because of our sins. He endured punishment that made us well because of his wounds we have been healed. All of us have wandered off like sheep. All Each of us has strayed off his own path. But Yehovah caused the sin of all of us to attack him. He was treated harshly and afflicted but did not even open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughtering block, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not even open his mouth. He was led away after an unjust trial, but who even cared? Indeed, he was cut off from the land of the living because of the rebellion of his own people he was wounded. They intended to bury him with criminals, but he ended up in a rich man's tomb because he had committed no violent deeds nor had he spoken deceitfully. Though the Lord desired to crush him and make him ill, once restitution was made, he will see his descendants and enjoy long life, and the Lord's purpose will be accomplished through him. Having suffered, he will reflect on his work. He will be satisfied when he understands what he's done. My servant will acquit many, for he carried their sins. I have a feeling that the leadership will finally come to grips with what Isaiah 53 is talking about. They will acknowledge once and for all, finally, after all these centuries, and say, oh, Yeshua, you were the one. But we couldn't see you. You were right there, but you looked like Joseph the Egyptian. We could not see you, who for you, see you for who you were. But now we finally get it. Now it finally comes into focus for us who you really are. Jesus was looking for fruit, but he found none. He found none, unfortunately. And so as a result, Jerusalem and the leadership of Judah would face judgment. They would face judgment. All prophesied by God. All necessary. It's really incredible when you think about all of these jigsaw piece puzzles, puzzle pieces, how God fit them together. He allowed each of us to have our own free will, to make our own decisions and choices for our lives, good, bad, and ugly. And yet he worked with all of those decisions and he created something so radical, so profound that we can just look at it and say, oh my God, you are incredible. Thank you. Thank you that you put all this together. So, lest we become arrogant and think, wow, that was Jews. No, no. <laughs> Let's be humble. Let's be grateful for what God has done because he used their rebellion just like he's been using our rebellion. And because we're all in rebellion to some extent, we're all going to face tough times in life. The more you pursue righteousness, well, the better. I highly recommend it. You'll have less pain in your life, but you'll still have pain. You'll still have pain. There will still be trials. It doesn't just because you keep Torah perfectly doesn't mean that you're not going to have any trials. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. In fact, you're going to be tested do you really want to keep this? Or are you just doing it because it's sort of in vogue right now? It's just kind of what your friends are doing. Do you really want to do what God said to do? You will be tested. Keep that in mind. Know for sure that you'll be tested to see if this is truly where you want to be. And if you do, then you'll come out. You'll, you'll keep doing it. But if you don't, then, then clearly you'll make a different decision. Well, it says in verse 10, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And a woman who was there 
was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten herself up completely. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said, Woman, you are freed from your infirmity. Then he placed his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. But the president of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the crowd, There are six days in which work should be done, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from its stall and lead it to water? Then shouldn't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be released from this imprisonment on the Sabbath? When he had said this, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. And then he asked the question, what is the kingdom of God like? Now, this issue of the Sabbath. Jesus does more to upset the teachings about the Sabbath than any other thing, as far as I can tell. He's always doing something on the Sabbath. One time, what does he do? He finds this blind man, so he spits in the ground, makes a little bit of mud, and puts it in the guy's eyes. Now, why did he do that? Well, there was this teaching in the Mishnah that you're not allowed to heal a blind man on the Sabbath by making spit and this little bit of mud with spit. This was this had been forbidden for some reason. Now, lest we start thinking, well, those, again, crazy Jews, why would they do that kind of stuff? We have to appreciate a little bit of what they were trying to do. Remember, they had gotten kicked out of the land in the days of Daniel. And Jeremiah, they'd been kicked out because they continued to break the Torah. So they come back in and they say, you know what? We don't want to do that again. We want to be gung-ho for God. So we're going to keep his words. How do we do that? So they, they, they went and they started to actually study the Bible. This is when the rabbinic movement started and is in the second temple period under the day, in the days of Ezra, Nehemiah. Good times. So it starts off good. But what they do is they start to create something called the Mishnah. Mishnah is, means second. In other words, it's the second law. And so they would have the commandment, do not murder, do not kill or steal or whatever, don't commit adultery. They, we have these commandments, honor the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath. But now we don't want to break this. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this fence around it. Because we don't want to break that commandment. So we're going to put this fence around it. And what happened is this fence, this second Torah, became as important as the actual commandment by God himself. It took on the, the equal importance. So not only can you not steal, but you, all these other things that have now come up as tradition, you have to keep those as well. I think they meant well. They meant well. But they were adding, and God tells us, do not add and do not take away any of the words from this Torah, from this instruction. So we're not to add and we're not to take it away. Now, we are guilty of this ourselves. Because we have these unwritten rules of what a Christian can and cannot do. Now, some of us have come out of some of the more traditional um, churches because we are looking for something else. Well, let's be, let's be fair. Just because we're messianic doesn't mean that we're impervious to that either, are we? We can come up with our own little things. Well, you know, we messianics do it this way. You guys do it that way, but we do it this way. And we can have our own set of traditions that we add just like everybody else. Okay? So let's be careful. Let's not cast stones too quickly here. Let's look at our own lives first and let God worry about the other guys. Let's worry about our lives. I'll worry about my life. You worry about your life. And let's try to improve the guy right here. Okay? And not the person over there. Because that's 
the only thing you can do. And here, there was this issue on the, on the Sabbath. Now, there were different schools of thought about what you were allowed and not allowed to do on the Sabbath. So the, the Alexandrian Jews or the Hellenistic Jews had a much more, let's call it liberal approach to what the Torah actually said. Liberal in a good way, okay? Liberal in a good way saying that, no, we, it was really filled with more grace. It was filled with more love. And there was a more stringent school of thought that said, no, you can't do anything because now you're not only breaking the Sabbath, but you're breaking what we have interpreted the Sabbath to mean. And so Jesus wasn't against the Sabbath, not at all. He was against the interpretation or the traditions that had been attached to the Sabbath. And that is part of the challenge is that now 2,000 years removed, and if we don't understand what was happening historically, culturally, then it can be very easy to, to lose sight of what Jesus is trying to do. He's not trying to, out, to do away with the Sabbath, not at all. In fact, this whole idea that the Sabbath has been done away with, that it's been changed, you will never find that once in the entire Bible. Show me. Where did God say, I'm done with the Sabbath? Thanks. That was a nice experiment. I know I created I got this extra day now. I mean, really think about it. God must have been in a real, real pickle. Like, gosh, I created this extra day, but now I've decided to change it to the first day. What do I do with the seventh day? I don't know. Go back and work. It's fine. I know I did the whole thing at creation, but I've had a kind of change of heart. He didn't do that, did he? No, God doesn't do that. Thank God. He doesn't change his mind like that. He's pretty solid, right? He shook at his track record. He doesn't change uh, willy-nilly. He just kind of sticks with, well, this is the way it is. This is how it's going to be forever. So Jesus is fully endorsing the Sabbath because he's the one who created the Shabbat. But what are you allowed to do on the Sabbath? This is a very pertinent question. What are we allowed to do on the Sabbath? Are we allowed to do good on the Sabbath? Well, absolutely. And Jesus pulls out this illustration. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from its stall and lead it to water. So just because it's the Sabbath, does that mean that your animals don't get to drink? Sorry. You know, I know you're thirsty, donkey or horse. But if I were to untie you and lead you to water, that would be considered work and I'm not supposed to work. So therefore, you have to go without water today. Is that the spirit of the Sabbath that God wants us to embrace? Not at all. Not at all. He, the whole point of the Sabbath is to rest, to let your animal rest, but not to make it suffer. Not at all. In fact, you should still do good to your animals. And this is why I have no issue with a dairy farmer who gets up at 4.30 in the morning and goes out and milks his cows on the Sabbath. Well, you think just because it's Sabbath, they don't need to get milked? How do you think the cows are going to feel about that? Moo, right? Are they going to be really happy? Sabbath, bad, you know. They're not going to be happy. No, they still need to get milked. They still need to get their food. They still need their water, right? Because God does care about the animals. In the book of Proverbs, it says, the righteous man considers the life of his animals. So we're to treat them kindly. We can still have, you know, steak and all that stuff, but we're at least to treat them kindly with some respect or humanely, as it were. So he's saying, look, if you do that for your animals, how much more should I heal this daughter of Abraham? This daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound 18 long years. Think about that, 18 years. And this woman is kind of hunched over. She just she can't stand up. She, I'm sure she'd like to. This is not a fun position. But whatever has happened, she's gotten into this position. How do we know? Now, it's interesting that Satan has bound her 18 long years. Now, again, we don't know what happened to this woman. But we know that Satan is very crafty. And much of what Satan does, probably most of what he does, happens right here. Was she 
worrying herself to death? Maybe. Or was it an actual infirmity that Satan placed on her? Maybe. We just don't know. So whether it was psychologically induced or whether it was demonically applied to her, somehow oppressed over her, we're not sure. But either way, Jesus says, you are released. You're freed from your infirmity. She's in bondage and he frees her. And so then he goes into what is the kingdom of God like? And he's going to tell us that we need to strive to enter in through the narrow gate into the kingdom. And I think that there have been challenges about understanding what is the kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God here and now? Or is it in the future? Or is it both? And I would like to suggest that it's actually both. Because we know that there is a future kingdom coming. We know that the Son of Man is going to return with his angels. He will set up his throne and he will judge the nations. He will bring them before him like sheep and like goats. And he will separate the goats out. And he will have his kingdom where he's ruling and reigning with a rod of iron for 1,000 years and then forever. So that's real. That's coming. That's future. But we've also seen that Jesus went out and he was preaching that the kingdom of God was near and people needed to repent to enter into it. So how do we get into the kingdom of God? I want to talk about necessary and sufficient conditions. Necessary and sufficient conditions. It is necessary for God to do the work for us to get into the kingdom, but it's not sufficient. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to, the, to God taking Israel out of the wilderness. Out of Egypt, excuse me. So they were in Egypt, they were slaves. It was necessary that God would come and he would free them. It was necessary that God would do the ten plagues and make it possible for them to then leave Egypt. But it was not sufficient. It was necessary that God did all those things but it was not sufficient because each person still had a choice to make whether they were going to take the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorpost. Had they not done that, then they would have suffered the death of the firstborn. So it was necessary what God did, but it wasn't sufficient. They also had to be ready with their staff in hand, their sandals on and ready to go. And they actually had to get up, leave their little bungalow, and walk out the door. Walk out of Egypt. They had to then trust and walk through the Red Sea. So again, it was necessary. All those things that God did, they could not have escaped without God's intervention. But it was not sufficient to bring them into the kingdom. Because they still had to make choices along the way. And not only did God do all those things and take them into the wilderness and bless their socks off, it still wasn't sufficient because they still had to make a choice whether they were going to believe or not. And this is where we read in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, God says, Oh, that they would listen as he speaks. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of testing in the wilderness. There your fathers tested me and tried me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I became provoked to that generation and said, Their hearts are always wandering, and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my anger, they will never enter my rest." See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has an evil, unbelieving heart that forsakes the living God, but exhort one another each day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may become hardened by sin's deception, for we become partakers with Christ, if in fact we hold our initial confidence firm until the end. As it says, oh, that today you would listen as he speaks, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. 
For which ones heard and rebelled? Was it not all who came out of Egypt under Moses' leadership? And against whom was God provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness? And whom, to whom did he swear that they would never enter into his rest, except those who were disobedient? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. They could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, we must be wary that while the promise of entering his rest remains open, none of you may seem to have come short of it. For we had good news, the gospel, proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard did them no good, since they did not join in with those who heard it in faith. So God did everything that was necessary for the ancient Israelites to be saved, to be delivered from their Egyptian oppression. He did everything necessary for them to have freedom and to walk in faith. He did everything necessary, but it wasn't sufficient because they still had to make a choice to enter into the kingdom of God. They still had to make a choice to enter into the kingdom of God. So looking now at Luke, here he's saying concerning the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God like and to what should I compare it? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree and the wild, bird, wild birds nested in its branches. Hmm. Again, he said, to what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like the yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all the dough had risen. So he's likening this kingdom of God, which is both now and in the future. So in order for us to come into the kingdom of God, we consider this parable that he's given us a mustard seed. It's tiny. It's small. You plant it in the heart and it begins to grow, begins to expand until it's going to fill your entire life. Same, same thing here. A woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all the dough had risen. Here, this yeast, it goes into the dough and it starts to permeate it until the entire dough is filled with this yeast. Now, there have been commentators that have taken this and said, well, this is you know, somehow a, a bad thing because mustards and uh, birds uh, are always indicative of evil. I don't think that's what Jesus was getting at here. I really don't. I think he's trying to say what's happening is that this tiny little seed begins to fill the entire space. And the little seed of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, of God in your life, of being present with God, it should start here. And then it starts to expand <clears throat> until it's filled every, <coughs> excuse me, until it has filled every aspect of your life. That's what it ought to do. It doesn't happen initially. When you first come to knowledge of God and you decide to come into a relationship with the God of all creation of heaven and earth, you start small. You don't do everything at once. In fact, this is exactly what we see in Acts chapter 15. This is called the Jerusalem Council. And there was this dispute that had arisen. What must you do to be saved? Well, within Judaism, there was a debate between the Hellenistic Jews and the more stringent uh, Jerusalem Jews as to what a person had to do to become a convert to Judaism. And the Hellenistic, the more liberal, or uh, the nicer <laughs> Jews, if you will, they were saying, look, all a person needs to do is repent from gross idolatry. So don't worship idols anymore. Uh, be baptized. And then with your hands raised in worship to heaven, study the Torah and you'll figure it out. Whereas the more stringent school said, no, if you want to become one of us and enter into Judaism and become part of the covenant, 
you first have to get circumcised and you have to study the Torah for about a year at least. And then we'll decide if you can become one of us, if you can become a convert. And so the Jerusalem school is saying, no, let's not lay upon these converts something that neither we nor our ancestors could do. Let's just keep it easy. He says, so now why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. All right, so they're saying, come as you are. That's sufficient. You don't have to do anything else to come to the Lord. And But what they say then, so what they need to do is to, uh, let's see here, but we write, uh, but that we should uh, write to them a letter telling them to abstain from things defiled by idols, from sexual morality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. So they're taking four things directly out of Torah, out of the book of Leviticus, saying these are the four things that you need to do as prerequisites to become a convert. Just a convert. You don't stop here, but this is the beginning of your conversion process. And then he says, for Moses, that is Torah, for Moses, or Torah, has had those who proclaimed him, or the Torah, every in every town from ancient times, because he is read aloud in the synagogues every Sabbath. So they're, they're saying the same thing that the more liberal Jewish school of thought was saying is, look, just repent, give up your idolatry, be baptized, and then worship God, and the study of Torah will take care of everything else. So as we come into this relationship with God, it starts out like a little seed. We, we come in, we know practically nothing about God. We don't know what the word really says. But now we, we've, we've come to that conclusion, the realization, oh my goodness, why am I in rebellion to the King of Kings, to the Lord of all creation? I want to walk with him. I want to be his partner, be his friend, and be on that same wavelength as him. I'm not going to be in opposition to him. I'm not going to walk against the wind. I want to walk with the wind. All right? If the Holy Spirit is blowing, do you want to walk against him? All right? Then you're like, oh, you're trying to walk against the wind. You ever done that? It's so hard to do. But when the wind is to your back, you're like, oh my goodness, this is so easy. Because then there's, there's no conflict. There's no struggle when you're walking with the holy wind of God, the Holy Spirit of God. We want to walk with him. And the way that we do that is we continue to study his word. And it's little by little. It's a seed that keeps growing until it fills every part of our lives. And we want that to indeed fill every part of our lives. But then he says, Then Jesus traveled throughout towns and villages, teaching and making his way toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? So he said to them, Exert every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and start to knock on the door and beg him, Lord, let us in. But he will answer you, I don't know where you came from. Then you'll begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he'll reply, I don't know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west and from north and south and take their places at the banquet table in the kingdom of God. But indeed, some are last who will be first, and some are first it will be last. So he he speaks of a future time, but how do we make sure that when that day comes and he shuts the door, that we're on the inside and not the outside? Because he tells us right here, it's really not enough to just 
hear the sermons. It's not enough to just have heard Jesus in the street. Well, I heard you teaching in the street. I'm, I'm familiar with you. I know who you are. So it's not that Jesus doesn't actually know mentally who this person is, but there's no relationship. There's no connection between these two. I don't know you. Get away from me, you, you evildoers, you workers of iniquity, you lawless people. What law is he talking about? The law of God, the Torah. Because if I'm, if I'm in relationship with God, I'm going to walk in accordance with the instructions that he has laid out for me. Because I believe that he's good. I believe that he's just. I believe that he's actually looking out for my best. And so I'm going to do those things that he's told me to do. It doesn't mean that I do them flawlessly. But as I continue to walk and I mature in my relationship with God, those besetting sins that maybe got me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even more. Now I'm like, you know, that was kind of stupid. I'm not going to do that anymore. That wasn't a really good idea. Because I'm learning, I'm growing. And just like that, that mustard seed, it continues to fill every place of my life. Just like that leaven that's filling that lump, the kingdom of God principles are filling me until it saturates every part of my being. Sometimes I wish it would happen faster. <laughs> Sometimes I don't, actually, because I know for it to happen faster, it usually requires more tests. And tests aren't always comfortable, but they're necessary. So just because you're familiar with Jesus, well, I, you know, I, I went to church a few times and, you know, I, I think I had a Bible on my shelf and, uh, you know, I studied about you a little bit in school. It's not enough. Jesus is continually telling us that we have to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So again, when we consider the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, absolutely necessary. There can be no salvation apart from his completed work on the cross. Just like the Israelites were not going to get out of Israel without God's intervention. It just wasn't going to happen. It was absolutely necessary that God intervene in their situation. But it wasn't sufficient they individually still had to make a choice to put the door on the the blood on the doorpost to have put on their shoes and have their walking staff to to go they had to do what god instructed them to do or they would have been left behind so is jesus death necessary you better believe it is absolutely there is no salvation apart from his death on the cross but that's not enough because you still have to believe. You still have to then do what he tells you to do. Now, there's a very fine line here because people say, well, wait a second. Are you saying that I'm going to add to my salvation? No, I'm not saying that at all. Were, were the Israelites able to add to the salvation that God wrought for them when he took them out of Israel? No, of course not. He did it all. He got all the credit. Wow, God, you did this amazing thing. That's why they all sang for joy when they got to the other side of the Red Sea. Look what God did for us. This is incredible, right? Praise Yehovah. Praise him for he's so good. Look what he did. He vanquished all of our enemies. He did that. But they still had to walk through, you see? So we're not adding to it. We're cooperating with it. We're cooperating with it. And I, I share this because I think it's so important that we don't become lazy. And I've heard so many sermons in my life that just kind of, in my opinion, they're just kind of lazy. Hey, Jesus did it all. Just sit back and relax. Sort of the Calvinistic thing. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm not Calvinistic. I don't like Calvin. Uh, strongly disagree with the whole Calvinistic teaching. Calvinism basically teaches that, look, um, God is sovereign. He's already chosen before the foundation of the world who's going to be saved and who's not. 
So, you know, way back when, God said, you guys, you're in. Isn't that nice of me? Pretty cool, huh? You guys, I'm just not going to choose you. Sorry. And if God doesn't choose you, well, you're, you're destined for hell. That's, in a nutshell, that's basically the Calvinistic doctrine. I do not believe that at all. Not at all. Okay? But I don't believe that I can somehow earn my salvation either. I don't believe that if I do enough good things, then God's like, well, hey, let's say you did this one, you did that. You, all right, you got 100, you're in. I don't think it's that way either. Is that he did everything necessary for me to be saved, but because I am made in his image and in his likeness, I have this thing called free will. So it's my prerogative to decide, to choose where I'm going to go, how I'm going to live my life. Am I going to live in accordance with God's standards, accordance with, with, his, uh, with his revealed instructions? Well, will I want to do that. Is there even a seed in my heart that's starting to grow? Or have I just thrown it along the, the, the wayside? That's the decision that we all have to make. So it's not that I'm earning my salvation. I'm cooperating and agreeing with God, and I want to do the things that he's told us to do. And Jesus continually tells us that you have to enter through the narrow door. I don't think this is just to get to heaven, so to speak. This isn't just a how do I get to heaven talk. Because that's always putting our, all of our eggs in the, in the hereafter basket. And trust me, the hereafter is going to be cool. But it starts today. It starts today. How do I become part of the kingdom of God right here and now? There's a glorious future ahead. Hallelujah. But I'm not going to worry about that at the moment. I'm going to worry about right here today. How do I become part of the kingdom of God right now? Well, the question, hey, uh, Lord, uh, will only a few be saved? It's pretty challenging, the things that you're telling us. What's going on here? You're really going in the face of tradition. You're, you're, you're challenging us, Lord. What do we do? And so he says that you have to strive to make every effort to enter through the narrow door. So this means that we want to follow Jesus, to the very best of our ability, we know he's gracious. We know he's good. That's the good news. So we're not like stressed. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Don't think of it that way. Don't think of heaven as this goal that I'm trying to attain, but think of how am I living right now? Am I living in accordance with God's revealed kingdom principles? Or am I just one of the Israelites who got out of Egypt? I'm in the wilderness but I never got to enter into the promised land because there was no faith. I didn't believe. I was there. I saw all the works of God, but I just decided not to believe. I believe that is what Jesus is getting at here. Not everybody that left Egypt entered into the promised land. A whole generation disqualified themselves because they were not willing to walk in faith. Because they were not willing to walk in faith, they forfeited going into the promised land. Again, everything was, that was necessary for them to enter had been done, but it wasn't sufficient because God still left things in their choice to enter or not to enter. And so they chose not to. They heard the words, they saw the deeds, but they didn't go deep into their heart to actually make a difference for them. And certainly people will be weeping and gnashing when they see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom. But you yourselves thrown out. You need to be careful. At that time, some Pharisees came up and said to Jesus, get away from here because Herod wants to kill you. But he said to them, go and tell that fox, look, I'm casting out demons and performing healings today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will complete my work. Nevertheless, I must go my way today and tomorrow or the next day because it is impossible that a prophet should be killed outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you'd have none of it. Look, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, 
that you will not see me until you say, Baruch haba, Hashem Yehovah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem because that's where prophets get killed. Again, he's speaking here to these Jewish leaders who were like whitewashed tombs. They were just like their fathers who killed the prophets. And then they were making tombs for the prophets. But they didn't actually believe the things that the prophets said and do what the prophets told them to do. And Jesus is here weeping. But I'll tell you, one day it's going to all be restored when yeshua comes back when he opens up the heavens and he comes on his horse he will return and he will set up his kingdom that will have no end but until that day there's a blindness and he here weeps over jerusalem because they would have none of it they would not repent they would not turn and your house is forsaken. I believe that we, we saw the beginning of the restoration of Israel in 1948. I don't think it's the completion, though. It's only the, the inception of this beginning. And what we're waiting for now is for the restored national modern Israel that now has a Jewish leadership. We're waiting for them to say, Baruch haba, B'Shem Yehovah. When they say that, about Jesus, then he will return. And unfortunately, I think it will take some trials, a few more trials. <laughs> They've seen a couple, but they'll see some more, unfortunately. But when they do, when they finally acknowledge who he is, then Yeshua will come running. And that's going to be glorious. And I will talk about that in two weeks when I talk about what it's going to look like the day that Yeshua returns. It's going to be a glorious day, a very exciting day. I can hardly wait. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for your word. We love it. But it's also challenging to us, Lord. We acknowledge that we so often act like those children of Israel in the wilderness who had every reason to believe and yet chose not to. We pray that we will make every effort to enter in through the narrow door and become part of your kingdom, that we will live those kingdom principles in our lives that we will not be slothful but we will continue to do what you have asked us to do and Lord we realize that it's really for our own good that you've told us these things we're we're not just doing them because you told us to but they're good for us may we embrace everything you've told us to do to know that it's good it leads to peace and joy and happiness we thank you so much. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me? Let's let's do the Lord's Prayer. I, I really like to sing this. Jesus told his disciples, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. B'shem Yeshua Mashiachenu. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ our Lord. Go in peace. Have a great Shabbat. And have a good Shavuot. Shavuot Tov. God bless.